about and uh, hopefully learn about what it is that we do and uh, perhaps even just, you know, maybe, uh, you know, derive a little bit of knowledge from this morning all by itself, okay? So we'll get right into it, okay? A digital Marketing Introduction, a peek inside a course from eloquo.ca. All right, as you may have seen in the bio, my name is Jordan St. Jacques. Um, once upon a time, I was a concert promoter operating up and down the east coast of the USA. And my, uh, my, my transition into digital marketing actually began back in 2004, uh, when while I was in that business, I was the uh, first person in the world to take a profile over a million friends on, a, on an old site called MySpace, which you may remember from back in the day. Uh, it was a little bit of a surreal experience. I uh, wasn't even a tech guy back then, uh, but one of my uh, one of my street team girls who was passing out my flyers came up to me and said, "Why aren't we doing it in MySpace?" And so I said, "Well, since I don't know what MySpace is, why don't you show me what MySpace is?" So we uh, we we went to Kinko's in Niagara Falls on the U.S. side and rented a terminal, and uh, she proceeded to show me about uh, all all the things about MySpace, and of course, it was a target marketer's dream because you could actually target by school and uh, you know some other things that MySpace offered you with respect to uh, you know hyper targeting and things like that. And uh, we fell in love with it, and so you know over uh, using the power of MySpace over the next few years, we actually took a one city operation into a twenty four city operation uh, by the time two thousand and eleven rolled around. Um, eventually parlaying everything into contracts with Live Nation and Viacom. So, you know, those were some good times. And yet I, uh, I was always using this newfound digital marketing power within the context of my own business. I wasn't really an agency back then. Later on, I returned home to my, uh, my hometown of Ottawa in 2013. And uh, by 2016, I had been accepted at the Invest Ottawa Incubator for a startup called LottoProxy.com. Uh, later on, I actually uh, moved on from Invest Auto at Bayview Yards to Carlton's Lead to Win Incubator, where I am now. I'm also a guest lecturer on all things digital marketing for Professor Tony Belletti at Carlton's Technology and Innovation Management Program. And last but not least, I own an agency called Digitera.agency, which you can find online. And yes, it is .agency. There's no .com or .ca or anything like that. So to say the least... I've been at this for a very, very long time and have had some successes uh, with the power of digital marketing. I, uh, I'm still not a, you know, Mark Zuckerberg billionaire or anything like that, but uh, I, uh, you know, I've had a pretty good run with uh, respect to digital marketing and I, uh, I'm very qualified to offer this advice to you today. So let's move on. Um, the importance of digital marketing, okay? So on the uh, it's been on the rise since the days of myspace back then digital marketing wasn't really taken seriously it wasn't until facebook actually lent some structure to the whole digital marketing thing my if you, anybody who remembers myspace will remember that it was kind of a wild west of uh, of social networks it was a mess the code was a mess um you know it wasn't organized properly the ad placements were terrible and so the uh, you know madison avenue didn't really uh, engage with myspace back in those days, but they did engage with Facebook because Facebook actually did it right and uh, and won the, the, the war of the social networks, uh, for lack of a better word, let's say, okay? Um, digital marketing in and of itself is now, of course, since 2017, is the number one category of, uh, of advertising expense within the overall marketing mix. It's more than TV, more than radio, uh, you know, more than out of home, more than anything. And uh, and rightly so. I mean, it is the number one way of reaching people. And as we're going to find out within this hour, it's uh, it's a way of of reaching people in a very, very targeted format. So no longer does your ad expense actually get wasted on people who don't necessarily want to receive your advertising, such as the, uh, you know, the person watching a TV show. Uh, you know, who's not really the, the demographic that that TV show calls for, let's say. Um, but the, mo the most important thing that I want to talk about today, though, with respect to the importance of digital marketing is, <coughs> excuse me, bad time to have a regular cough. Eh? Um, anyway, the, like I said, the most important thing I want to talk about today is we're in really, really unusual times right now. I mean, apart from the fact that, you know, 
millions of job losses and people are scared and things like that. I mean, we're going to come out of that, right? Things will get back to normal. Every single biotech firm in the world now is racing for a cure, and it's only a matter of time before there's a vaccination against coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, and things will reset to normal. But what is that normal going to be? We don't even know at this point, right? I mean, the new normal is something that we've got to figure out, and you know, when you look at different industries, I mean, okay, so take movies, for example. Are people really going to want to go back to the movie theater where all those seats are in close proximity to each other and one single cough from an infected person will infect the entire theater? Um, I don't know about you guys, but one of the, the two of the movies that I've watched since uh, in the month of March, since all this stuff started uh uh, you know, going in overdrive. Uh, one movie is Contagion, which Laura, with Lawrence Fishburne, and the other movie was an older movie back from the '90s um, called Outbreak, with uh, Dustin Hoffman and uh, and what's his name there, the old guy. Um, I can't remember it right now for some reason, but uh, he's a famous actor. Um, anyway, the uh, in in the Outbreak movie, there was actually a scene in that movie where uh there was a you know an infected person in the movie theater and of course they you know make the whole big dramatization of the disease spreading within the movie theater and i thought to myself okay look at where we are right now movie theaters are shut down and really you know with the advent of netflix the movie the movie theater business has been dying for years so now all of a sudden you know with this whole you know social distancing thing what is going to be the new normal are people going to uh, you know, remember this forever, or are they just going to forget about it and move back to whatever the old normal was? We need to watch out for that as digital marketers, because all of a sudden there's going to be new digital sales funnels that we're going to have to either create or adapt to uh, in order to uh, survive in the new world and to, you know, to thrive in the new world. And I think that, uh, you know, with respect to what we're talking about today with the importance of digital marketing, I think it's really, really uh, an opportune time you know, not only just to go over what the course at Eloquo is, but to also uh, to also think to ourselves, you know, how is COVID-19 going to affect our industry, whatever industry you happen to be in? And how do I react to that? Uh, you know, how do I how do I give advice to my boss or my colleagues, let's say, to, uh, you know, to how to adjust our, our business model, you know, completely? and take advantage of new opportunities that will come out by the usage of digital marketing. And so, you know, it's always a, you know, it's one of those things with digital marketing. There's always the the necessity of keeping your eye out, uh, you know, keeping an eye open, let's say, and, uh, and making sure that we pay attention to circumstances on the ground. I mean, that's always the case, but I think it's even more of a case these days, um, you know, and to, to give a little bit of an example, uh, you know, unfortunately, one of my friends, her husband died uh, about four days ago, and they can't even have a funeral. So, of course, one of my first ideas was was actually putting together a platform so that people could, you know, funeral homes could stream uh, virtual funerals, let's say, to people who didn't necessarily want to be in such close proximity to uh, to people. I mean, if you've ever been to a uh, like a funeral of somebody who, you know, had an active social life or a wide list of colleagues, let's say. Some of those uh, funeral ho uh, homes can actually get really, really packed up. And, uh, and you know, with this new age of COVID-19, even after the vaccine comes into place, are we really going to want to be in such close proximity again, right? We have to watch out for these things and we have to figure out what the new normal is as we go forward. So. Um, oh, okay. So just before I um, I get right into the uh, to the slides here, to the actual meat of the content, just know that uh, as you can see from looking at my screen, I have the chat bubble open, and uh, I will leave some time for Q and A at the end. Uh, we'll go to about noon uh, in terms of of content, and then for that last fifteen minutes uh, from noon till twelve fifteen, if you have questions, you can ask them. But if a question is highly relevant to what I'm talking about at that time, please don't necessarily wait till noon to ask me that question. Feel free to just get into it right away and uh, and we'll adapt the answer to that question on the fly as we go through the course content here. 
All right, so let's begin. Um, here we go. Okay, so what I like to explain to clients when they come to me is if we remember back to elementary school, there was the color wheel and it was three colors, red, blue, and yellow. And if you move those colors around and overlapped and here and there with those three different elements, you could create new colors. Like purple was a combination of two of those colors, let's say. And, uh, and this is what the big five pillars of digital marketing are all about. And of course, those big five pillars, as you can see from my screen here, are web, search, social, blast, and mobile. And I'll go through them because it's important to understand what they are and why they are big five pillars, as opposed to this next slide here, which we'll get to in a second. You can see that these are offshoots. Now, these terms like e-commerce and lead generation, paid media, et cetera, et cetera, they're all very important things within digital marketing. You have to pay attention to these terms and what they mean, but they're not primary elements, okay? These are your building blocks. And if you understand these five building blocks to some extent, then you will always be able to actually, uh, you know, either create your own digital marketing campaigns or at the very least be able to supervise whoever is actually doing the creation of your digital marketing or the execution of your digital marketing, let's say. So let's go through them number one uh, or one by one, let's say. So the first pillar is web, right? Now, let's face it, websites, they're not really a sexy topic anymore. They were sexy 20 years ago, 25 years ago, but they're not the sexy topic anymore. The sexy topic is mobile apps, native apps, right? iPhone, Android, but the website is still the holy grail of the hub of everything that you do on digital, okay? Make no mistake, and it'll be that way for some time, okay? Now, why? Because let's face it, you can go to a, a mobile device and you can either pull up a mobile website or you can pull up an app as well. So why is the website, let's say, the still the holy grail? Well, first of all, you can't have a, a, a mobile optimized website without an actual website, so there's one. But the biggest reason is, well, the clue for the biggest reason is the second entry. Websites can be crawled by Google, and that's how they determine your Google rankings. All right, so you can't rank on, on search unless you actually have a website. No rankings whatsoever, okay? Now, somebody might say, well, my Facebook page ranks. Well, your Facebook page is technically a website. So, therefore, yeah, your Facebook page can rank. But if you want really, really well-optimized uh, results on Google, you have to have a proper website, okay? Which is why, of course, uh, you know, if you're trying to save money on the on a website developer and you're trying to get through, uh, you know, needing to pay somebody four or five thousand bucks to actually pay, you know, do your website for you properly, you would might you might think to yourself that, oh, I'm going to use Wix or Squarespace or the GoDaddy website builder or something like that. The problem with those builders, right, is you can't control your own source code, which means that you can't actually optimize for your actual, uh, you know, your SEO optimization, let's say, right? Because there's two forms of, of search uh, or, or SEO, let's say, right? There's your on-site SEO and your off-site SEO here. Let me just actually change this just so we have some context here, okay? Now, there's on-site SEO and there's off-site SEO, okay? And what do those two things mean? On-site SEO talks about your code on your website, okay? It's one of those things where you have to have your code optimized. And this, of course, is the big difference. I mean, if you get some, you know, web designer, let's say, who comes in and says, yeah, I'll do your really nice looking website and I'm only gonna charge you 1,900 bucks. Well, the problem with that is you might think that's a good price, but he's probably leaving out a lot of the SEO considerations that need to be optimized within your code. So I, the first tool that I want to show you today is a tool that I use all the time. It's called SEOSitesCheckup.com, okay? And I'll tell you what. Why don't we go to the audience here? Who is brave enough to actually send in their site on the chat window so that we can analyze this. Anybody? Okay, so no brave people out there, right? 
I'll, I'll send a, hi, I just joined. My name is Eric Lupi and I'll, I'll send a site. How do I do that? Put it in the chat window. Do you see it? Hang on, I'm looking here. <laughs> uh, put it up in the chat window. Oh. Nope, hang on. The chat window. Well, My apologies. You can, you I can go to the little cloud on top of the right corner. I'm following on the web. How about I just give you the website? Okay, go ahead. Loving pause p a w s dot c a. There you go. It's not my site, but it's one that I help somebody with. Hold on. Is it Canadian or American? It's Canadian dot c a. Oh right, of course. Sorry. Okay. We're actually going to use a different tool. This is a tool that I use all the time. Okay, it's going to take too long. Actually, we've only got an hour, so I'm actually just going to go to a. Uh, okay, so okay. if anybody in Ottawa will will know of Wakefield Mill, right? And you can actually go in and see things like uh, like this tool here, Serpstat. You can actually go in and see like how many keywords are being ranked in Google. What's the visibility? What's the traffic numbers? Things like that, and you can actually tell how Google is taking a look at your website, right? So um, anyway, it's, it takes a while to actually learn this tool, so I'm not going to go through the whole thing today, but I am going to recommend that you use Serpstat. And uh, if you, uh, you know, once you actually take the, uh, the learning curve to actually get to know Serpstat, you'll actually be able to take all the errors that are in there and actually go in and fix them, right? Another tool that is really, really handy to use is... Um, Google Search Console. I don't know if a lot of you like I. So obviously I'm not with you today, so I have no idea in terms of the breakdown and who's a, a you know marketing professional and who's you know basically just a business owner or who's in government or anything like that. So the whole thing with Google Search Console, right, is if you go in here and once you enter your sites and do all, you know, all the necessary verification to prove to Google that you do own the site, then you're actually going to end up in situations like this where you can go in and actually see, if, if you can see my, my screen right now, I'm sharing it with you. Uh, for example, here, zero pages with errors, right? If Google itself sees an error, it will actually tell you about it, right? So the, these are things that you actually have to pay attention to with respect to Google. And uh, one of the other tools, I mean, we are I, the, the one that I like to use, I can't use it because the, uh, the free version only allows me to check one website a day. Um, I'm going to, okay, so what I'll do is I'll show you the the analysis that I ran for somebody's website earlier this morning, because we did the same class at nine o'clock. So here's SEO site checkup. Okay. This is a, a restaurant out of San Francisco. Uh, the guy was with us this morning at the nine o'clock class. And anyway, you might think that 75 is a good score, but it's actually not passes around a 95. Right. And so everything that's in red here needs to actually get fixed. Like for example, this guy's site is missing a meta description tag. That's a huge faux pas when it comes to SEO. And the other thing, it's not necessarily just a mistake, but it also results in Google giving a penalty to your site. So if you don't have like things like a title, I've actually even seen people without a meta title, right? Um, keyword usage test, he's failing there. Anything in red as I scroll down needs to be fixed. Image alt, that's a really, really basic area, okay? 
if you don't have your image alt tags defined properly, I mean, whoever did your website's just being lazy. Inline CSS tests, things like that. Anyway, the list goes on, right? So that tool is seositecheckup.com. Anyway, the thing about SEO, like I said, is it's on-site and it's off-site. And the reason why I showed you, this, especially that SEO site checkup tool, is that on-site is basically your website, right? And it can be coded, like a lot of, like I said, a lot of designers will just get in there and make sure it looks pretty for you and then put it up. And you might think that you have a nice shiny car, but under the hood is, uh, you know, it's just, uh, it's just a bunch of crap. Right, and you've got to make sure that whoever does your website pays attention to the actual on-site SEO aspect of things. Okay, then of course there's off-site SEO, and off-site SEO refers back to the, to the you know some of the items that Sergey and Larry from Google actually first put into the Google thesis back in 1998, and uh, and those basically uh, can be summarized as the as the big three of backlinks, blogging, and uh, and directory placements. Okay. So to explain what backlinks are, if you don't know, let's say uh, let's say there's a ho uh, like a small hotel and they have a hundred backlinks within the Ottawa area, and then there's Hyatt Hotels, which probably has millions of backlinks out there. The way Google sees it is that Hyatt Hotels, because they have more backlinks, are obviously more of a popular hotel company. Therefore, they deserve a higher ranking. Right, so backlinks have been a thing within SEO for you know ever since the beginning of SEO, and uh, and they're very very important to have. Which is why when I pulled up that SERP stat tool, one of the things that you might have seen me roll through were the number of backlinks that uh, LovingPause.ca actually had, and uh, and then of course blogging. Right, blogging is a massive massive component of SEO. So <laughs> when a client comes to me and says, "Hey, I don't have any rankings. I want to rank." What can you do for me, right? I say, okay, well, it costs X amount of dollars, and you're not going to see any results, uh, you know, until about three to six months in, right? And you know, of course, you know, the uh, the uh, unsophisticated digital person will, you know, complain about that. But you know, the thing about offsite search is you have to start blogging, and it takes a while for Google to actually see those blogs, right? Like our sites as regular people like if you're just running like a smaller medium sized business let's say google only crawls our sites once every 8 weeks on average whereas you know newspapers like the ottawa citizen they'll crawl that website once every 2 hours let's say right so we only get crawled once every 8 weeks uh you know but other sites like more important sites to the national interest or the international interest like a you know major newspaper website that kind of thing they'll get crawled much more frequently so as small business people or medium-sized business people, we've got to realize that you know we could start working on an SEO tomorrow, but Google might not even see our site with its crawlers, uh, affectionately called Google bots, for another eight weeks. And so therefore, that's why it takes time, right? Anyway, the number one component about blogging that really makes it worthwhile doing to actually rank an SEO is that uh, you have to remember that Google date stamps everything. Right, so if I make a blog article last year, April 1st, 2019, and it was an amazing blog article, the amount of SEO benefit that it's giving me one year later is almost nothing. Whereas if I write blog article on April 1st, 2020, then obviously it's going to give me very, very uh, current SEO boost because of the fact that Google date stamps it. And Google loves fresh content. So if you're pumping through, say, say you actually don't suffer from writer's block and you don't have a problem with writing and you can manage to pump out a blog article once a week or you know maybe even once every two weeks if your competitor is not doing that from a blogging point of view you will leapfrog them on you know on social or sorry on search uh within a couple of months right it's that simple and it's been proven over and over again like i'm not just talking you know because of what i believe like the way donald trump does or something like that this is empirical evidence that many many people have studied over time right we, you know there's a lot of of studies that get done on a frequent basis in all the blogs and journals and everything like that with respect to the seo professionals world and uh, and this is stuff that we see all the time another thing is you know google my business if you're not listed there then you're just hurting yourself right there's overall, there's about two to 300 ranking signals at any one time. 
and it's a heavily, heavily guarded formula, right? Google guards it. Uh, I mean, if anybody remembers that first Mission Impossible movie where Tom Cruise is hanging from the ceiling in that white room that, you know, where the computer is, it's not even hooked up to the internet for security reasons. That's the kind of room that, uh, that the Google master algorithm for search rankings has actually guarded it. And, uh, and it's, well, cause you know, and rightly so, I mean, it's the basis for a half a trillion dollar company roughly. Right. So anyway, search is, if you had to analyze search when, let, let's say you're a new business or you're, you know, a business that's just getting started with its digital marketing footprint, search is best defined as being very, very powerful in the long run. Right. But it takes an investment in time and energy and money to actually start getting those rankings. And it does take, uh, you know, it does take a, like a maintenance kind of expenditure, let's say, to actually maintain your rankings once you have them. Because the thing is, is that Google, the way the algorithm works, it's always a competition, right? You're always being ranked against other relevant companies. So if you're loving pause, um, what does, what, well, actually let's check out loving pause right now and see what it does. Okay, so this site is loading too slow. You might want to take a look at that. Yeah, tried everything. It's with GoDaddy. Sorry to hear about and, that. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's been painful. Okay, so I'm going to categorize this website as, as pet care, let's say, the overall general category of pet care. So let's say Loving Paws, you know, they do a bunch of SEO work at the beginning, and uh, and then all of a sudden, six months later, somebody new like, uh, you know, like uh, Pretty Kitties or something like that decides to mm -hmm. go against Loving Paws and and Loving Paws has stopped their SEO effort. Well, you know, Pretty Kitties is going to take over their ranking and they're going to rank higher than them. Right. It's always a competition, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing, too, is, it, you know, you have to remember that because it takes time, energy and money to actually get your organic rankings. Uh, there, you know, you have to say to yourself, okay, well, search is going to be critical to my long-term success, but it's not very good for getting customers tomorrow. And that's where social comes in. The next item on our list, social <coughs> is, you know, you can actually, I've seen people, I've even done it myself, create new profiles for a new brand and actually come out smelling like roses because they've acquired customers the same day. Like they created their profiles in the morning. And they're actually getting customers at night. And one of the biggest ways of doing this is something called hashtag sentiment analysis. And I'll, well, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a case study. The best way of looking at hashtag sentiment analysis is by looking at the wedding industry, which, by the way, has been wiped out with coronavirus, with COVID-19. I mean, not too many weddings or bar mitzvahs or corporate parties going on these days. And uh I do have a fair amount of customers uh, in that field, and uh, they're all telling me, like, you know, we can't pay our bills right now because we've had, you know, tens of thousands of dollars worth of event cancellations. And that just that's just per company, let's say. So, all right. So what does hashtag sentiment analysis mean, right, when it comes to social media? Using the wedding business as an example, right, we actually say to ourselves the best hashtag that we can use in order to draw attention to our profile is Hashtag engaged. Now think about that for a second. Let's say somebody uses hashtag engaged in a post. What kind of post do you think that might be? Right? And the answer is a bride that actually just got engaged. So somebody creates a, a wedding, a DJ company creates a profile, starts doing searches for posts that have actually used hashtag engaged, and then starts reaching out to those people. Hey, I saw that you got engaged. If you're looking for a DJ, to check us out. And then if that person or that DJ company has actually done a good job of doing a good website, uh, doing some good content marketing on their profiles, things like that, pictures, maybe some content marketing videos, then that bride-to-be is going to go on their site and check them out and actually say, okay, this is a person I'd like to actually follow up with. I've seen wedding DJ companies do this. Of course, this was before coronavirus, but uh, the, the aspect of hashtag sentiment analysis, whether it's outreach or inbound, right, actually does work. 
And so therefore you have to pay attention to making sure that your social media profiles are optimized to receive videos, uh, visitors from the time that you actually launch them, right? So if you're just one of these people that puts out a couple of social media profiles and says, oh, I'll get back to, you know, filling in the profile image or putting in the cover image or filling out the bio, I'll do that next week. No, you can't do that. When you create your social, <clears throat> when you create your social media profiles, you actually have to hop on those things right away. Make sure they're optimized because theoretically you could start receiving visitors tomorrow, acquiring customers tomorrow, today, right? It's, that's the, the difference between search and social. Search is, is going to generate more business in the long run, right? A lot more business, but it's, uh, it's something that you have to invest time and energy in, right? Whereas social is something that won't necessarily do as much business as search, but it's immediate, right? And then, of course, looking at immediacy, right? Both search and social lend themselves to paid ads. And paid ads is something that you can obviously take advantage of immediately, right? So, for example, let's say you, you, know, you start doing your organic SEO and you say to yourself, all right, I'm in this for the long run. I'm prepared to make that investment. But I still want to acquire customers on search today right? Well, then do some paid ads, right? Paid ads will, you know, anybody who's ever been on Google in the last year or two will know that the first four entries usually of a search are always your paid ads, right? So therefore, if you want a cheap way of actually, you know, if you, if you want to achieve immediate results and you're not prepared to wait, or you're going to do it in conjunction with an organic campaign, then simply just grab a paid ad and away you go, right? Now, I myself, uh, I'm kind of biased against paid ads. And the reason why is because I think that an organic footprint on social and search is much stronger in the long run for results. And yet at the same time, <clears throat> there's always needs for immediate results. Like for example, let's say you're a florist. All right. And you like, let's say, let's face it for the average florist shop, it's really, really hard to get a lot of organic followers, like true followers on Twitter, on Instagram, you're not really telling exciting stories. Like it's not like having a content marketing for, you know, like that one from a couple of years ago for Uber Air, all right, where they're showing people getting into an Uber type helicopter and moving from one city to the next, let's say. That's that's exciting stuff. And it generates a lot of followers. But you know, how, how many people are going to follow, uh, you know, something that's just about flowers and, you know, how good a florist is, right? Not not nearly as many. So let's say you're a florist and all of a sudden it's Valentine's Day coming up. Well, you've got to go to paid ads to sell those roses, right? And so therefore paid ads do have a place within the overall context of digital marketing. It's just that some people rely too, too much on paid ads. And to me, that's kind of lazy. I think that you have to do both where they're appropriate, right? If it's appropriate for you to actually have a paid ad because there's a, an immediate priority coming up, like for example, let's say, well, let's talk about COVID-19. I mean, Health Canada is putting out paid ads like crazy these days with respect to COVID-19. I mean, you know, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, they're all over the place. In fact, I've even heard that the crisis communications team for Health Canada that's on point on this is actually even thinking of doing paid ads on TikTok with influencers, which is, of course, the, the, you know, the social network for teenagers and young adults these days. And uh, the reason why they're doing it, of course, is because millennials are you know, still doing stupid things like going on spring break and packing the beaches in Florida and they're returning home with all these things. It's not a good thing. So the um, anyway, so yeah, so keep in mind, Paid ads, they do have their place, but they're not necessarily the be all end all. And it's important to have organic efforts for these things. All right. The fourth item, <coughs> excuse me. The fourth item on the list is blast. Blast is a catch all category of every kind of outbound communication that goes out in bulk, such as, well, primarily email blasting, but also text message blasting and, of course, push notification blasting. Okay. I'll say put a push notifications for mobile because they're primarily delivered through mobile. And we'll just talk about uh, email and text message blasting for the moment. OK, with respect to email, you have got to make sure that you're doing it properly. OK, if you're basically spamming people, you're going to get yourself a bad sender reputation. And 
and the the uh, the email service providers around the world are going to block you down within a matter of days. It's that sophisticated now. They're anti-spam detection things. But if you handle it properly, and you make sure that you're acquiring people organically who want to be on your list, these aspects, both email and text message blasting, can be very very powerful. Okay. So I'm going to give you a case study. A friend of mine who owns a clothing store in the Glebe named Delilah. And if you're ever on Bank and Third at the Starbucks there and you look across the street, there's her shop with the big flower logo, okay? She's a woman's clothing store specializing in clothing for women age 30 and up, professional women, let's say. And um, she runs, she's my client, and she runs a text message blasting uh, program that is done in a very optimal way and so i'll tell you about that and you can see the uh the logic behind her uh, her well the way she does things so she's a very customer friendly store her and her daughter and her you know who also runs it with her and her her various uh you know sales let's say what uh, what they do is when somebody buys something right and they're checking out the cash they ask that person whether they want to be on the advanced notification text message list and so that person actually has to verbally say yes in order to that for them to actually allow their cell phone number to be on that list. Eva will not compromise on that. Then what happens, it's like I said, it's called the advanced notification VIP text message list. A little bit of a mouthful, but anyway, what they do with that is they only blast out when there's a new collection of goods in the store. So for example, let's say, uh, uh, well, I guess there's a popular brand that uh, I've been told anyway that uh, of women's shoes called Jimmy Choo. And so when Eva gets a new uh, collection of Jimmy Choo shoes in the store, she'll actually blast it out, right? And it'll be very, very succinct and to the point. New collection of Jimmy Choo shoes in the store now. Come on in in the next 72 hours for 20% off. And what that the results of that kind of text message blasting does is that when Eva acquires a new collection and a comp and you know accompanies it with a blast to her VIP list, she actually sells out about fifty percent of that collection within seventy two hours. Now for retail, that's actually quite astounding, right? So you can see that if you handle blast marketing methods properly, uh, then uh, then you're good to go. Okay. Now, let's move over to mobile, and I'm going to explain uh, the big thing about mobile. First of all, with native apps, uh, they're much faster loading. You can also use mob you know, mobile-optimized websites as well. And these days, people are checking uh, a website more from their phone than they are from an actual desktop computer. So, But most importantly, though, what I want to do is point out the difference between a native app and a mobile website. I mean, I think we all know what they are, but the functionality that really gets me as a digital marketer is push notifications. And I'll tell you my own particular experience. So back in 2014, I was living in Los Angeles for the year. And anybody who's ever lived in L.A. for any amount of time pretty much knows that Las Vegas is considered a Los Angeles suburb. I mean, even though it's three and a half hours away, that's the psychology of it, right? People roll in on the weekend like crazy, and they roll it on Sunday afternoons. So what ends up happening uh, to me is while I was living in Los Angeles, I actually partake, partook in a Las Vegas holiday weekend. Drove into Vegas, saw a billboard saying, hey, come to Planet Hollywood, install the app, and we'll give you $50 in chips for free. Now, being uh, a free chip lover, I actually took advantage of that opportunity. And so uh, I go to Planet Hollywood, I install the app, and um, and I go and get my $50 in chips. So I see a couple of questions here, and uh, I'm going to come back to them. Uh, Cindy Kennedy, Eric Lupian, and Dean Campbell, I'll come back to your questions later, okay? <laughs> um, so, okay. Okay. so the... Um, the, the whole aspect of the free chips, I go, I get my chips, I, uh, I play them, I lose them all, of course, and then I go back to Los Angeles, right? But I still had the app installed on my phone. I didn't uninstall it, right? It didn't, you know, come to me psychologically to make sure that I uninstalled the app after all was said and done. So four weeks later, I come back to Las Vegas, and I have that app still installed on my phone. And when I passed into the southern point of the city on that Interstate 15, 
I actually get a, a, a push notification on my phone, right, from the app. Hey, welcome back to Las Vegas. Come to Planet Hollywood for another $50 in free chips. Well, where do you think I ended up? Of course, I went and cashed in my chips. I ended up at Planet Hollywood again. But I didn't do that because of the billboard. I did that because I got a push notification on my app through the phone, right? So therefore, that just shows you what push notifications are all about. Now, there's three types of push notifications. One, there's manual, where you can simply go to a computer, type in a push notification, then send it out manually to all of your uh, the people that have installed your app. The second one is geofence. Right. And that's the kind of push notification that I got in my Planet Hollywood example. Right. I passed through a polygon according, you know, overlaid on top of a map, according to the way the app is configured. And the app knew to send me a push notification. And, and so that, that's what they call a localization uh, push notification. Right. It's because you were in a certain area and you passed through that area and therefore it was an automated thing. Now, that was a wide angle one. Right. But there is another kind which is called iBeacons, which means that let's say, uh, so let's say I'm running a coffee shop and I have an iBeacon in, the, in the door of my store, front door of my store. Well, anybody coming within, say, 20 to 30 feet of that iBeacon will actually get an automated push notification. So um, let's say, I, you know, somebody who has my app installed and are walking past me, uh, you know, they'll get a little push notification saying, come on in for a half price coffee. Right, maybe I sell them a croissant at full price at the same time or something like that, right? And actually, you know, make my money on that aspect. But you can see that the push notification capabilities of a native mobile app are very, very powerful, right? This is, you know, this is at the top of the food chain when it comes to digital marketing, let's say. And in fact, Google actually even has it. So the local, uh, you know, short range push notifications don't even need you to have the app installed. You can actually just blast it out and every Android device within that 30 feet will actually get it. So, okay, so these are the big five pillars, right? You absolutely need to have these big five pillars, at least some of them, uh, in, in place in order to have a proper digital marketing footprint, okay? There are offshoots such as e-commerce, lead generation, paid media, content marketing, analytics, and influencer marketing, that are also part of digital marketing. And there are more offshoots as well. These are just six that I chose at the top of my head, <coughs> but there are more. And, uh, but these things are not primary elements, right? Like for example, e-commerce makes use of web search, social and blast and mobile. Lead generation makes use of web so search and social, et cetera, et cetera, right? Especially if you're doing any LinkedIn prospect generation, things like that. Paid media is something that you use on search and social. Uh, content marketing is something that you use on social and your website. You see what I mean? Like the different, the different, there are different pillars that go into any one of these offshoots that you can think of. And of course, the one of the most powerful ones these days is influencer marketing, uh, which I've done a ton of work in, and we'll get to in one of the future slides. Okay, so. Here, okay, so there there are three aspects. Well, like I said, I, so I'm going to backtrack a little bit. We're here to, you know, just basically give you a little sort of a digital marketing one hour primer and also show you about, you know, what's inside the big day long Eloqua course on intro to digital marketing. Okay, and there's three different aspects that we that we focus on within intro to digital marketing. Number one is the unique opportunity. Number two is the digital sales funnel. And number three is what you should be focusing on, okay? So let's go through each of these slides pretty quickly because we're come, we've only got 15 minutes left before Q&A session. So, and so the unique opportunity, like I said, is one of the things we concentrate on in the day-long course. And this is the thing that really got me back in 2004 is that I could create a MySpace profile and nobody was my middleman. I didn't have to go through anybody. And back then, you got to remember, like, you know, not only did we actually have to go through a radio station to buy commercials for our big events and things like that, but half the time we had to go through a reseller as well. And so therefore, you're dealing with two middlemen. And, you know, depending on what sort of supply chain you're dealing with, sometimes you can be dealing with three, four, five middlemen just to get to the right place, the right source. 
But with digital marketing, theoretically, you don't have to actually have any middlemen whatsoever, okay? You are your own TV producer by creating a video and putting it up on social. You are your own radio announcer by creating a podcast and publishing it, right? You see what I'm saying? There's no middlemen. You can be as creative and as crafty as you want. There's nothing holding you back. I mean, there's still a couple of basics. If you try and, you know, put, you know, nude porn on Facebook, for example, then obviously you're going to get slapped down by the community, right? But, <clears throat> but you know, the, overall, though, there's no middlemen. There's no censor. Which, of course, the politicians in the USA just happen to love that fact. But And that's another story. We're not going to get political today. So the other aspect is hyper-targeting. All right? So when I was running concerts in, uh, well, first in Buffalo and then in other cities up and down the east coast of the USA, right? The nice thing is, is what we were able to do is target by school because a school was usually, pro you know, had proximity to our venue. So let's say we were in, uh, let's say we were doing something in Manhattan. Well, we could actually pull up the schools in Manhattan and actually see who was linked to that school and target those people for the schools that were closest to our venue, as opposed to, wasting our effort by hitting people who were going to schools on the other end of Long Island, let's say, right? Or in uh, in Toronto, if anybody's in Toronto, right? If you're going to throw an event downtown, then you don't necessarily want to be reaching people who are in Barrie, right? All, you know, well, it depends if the event is big enough, I suppose, but still, like for a normal two to 3,000 mid-range level concert, you want to actually hit people up who are in close proximity. So that hyper-targeting that is a, a, you know, proximity is a hyper-targeting issue, right? We can target people by location. We can target people like, you know, by preferences. So if we actually, okay, so anybody who remembers Jersey Shore, one of the biggest events we ever threw was we actually hired Snooki uh, to actually come to an event in Rochester. This is like 2000, this is like just after season one and, you know, before they actually took off, let's say. Uh, but even then they were so popular that we were able to, uh, get basically every fan, every teenage fan of Snooki in Rochester out to an event. I mean, we did 4,000 people that night. And all we had to do was just say that we had Snooki. So fans of Snooki is another hyper target, or not fans of Snooki, but fans of an actual celebrity, let's say, is another form of hyper targeting, right? There's tons of examples for that. So um, last, of course, measurability and pivotability, right? With measurability and pivotability, if you uh, if there's something wrong with the metrics of your of your campaign, you can stop it and then explore why the campaign wasn't working the way you want it to. Adjust some of your campaign criteria and pivot it and restart it again. But of course, you can't pivot unless you're actually measuring. So you have to make sure that you set up a dashboard in every campaign. And of course, you know, in the day long course, we'll teach you how to do that properly. Go through some examples. Uh, for now, if you want to actually do a, you know, use a nice Canadian company for your metrics dashboard, I'm just typing, hold on, I'm just typing it in now. This is an Ottawa uh, startup company run by good people. The CEO is a guy named Alan Wiley, I think, until he's, he might have stepped down recently. I'm not exactly sure, but Clipfolio is a great company. Uh, very, very prominent in the uh, Ottawa innovation scene. So if you're looking for a good dashboard type um, application in order to measure your campaign metrics, Clipfolio is the way to go, okay? <clears throat> All right, let's keep going. The digital sales funnel. This is, a, this is the second type of thing that we're actually going to teach you in the day-long Eloqua course. Uh, basically, it's all about, you know, if you had to explain it in general terms, find someone uh, anywhere bring someone to somewhere, provide them with guidance incentives to get them to perform an action, call to action. And then once they perform that call to action, then you have a lead. That's lead. That's an example of lead generation, right? Somebody who's actually uh, done something to qualify themselves. Now, one of the biggest lead generator type of things that I've ever seen online is your prototypical mortgage calculator, right? So let's say you're looking to calculate a mortgage. So, you, you know, you, search on Google mortgage calculator and you bring one up and you fill in your details and you're right. And then as soon as you print, uh, you know, click the submit or the calculate button, right? What it does is it says here, please stick in your email so we can send you a report. And unthinkingly you actually stick in your email, but then 
once you get your report, then over the next 30 days, you all get start getting hit up by mortgage brokers, by insurance agents, by real estate agents, things like that. That's a lead generator, right? That whole uh, that whole aspect of the mortgage calculator, that's just basically a call to action to get people uh, to get you to qualify yourself as being interested in a particular good or service. And I guess what they think of the logic is, is that if you fill out and, you know, the form and actually submit your email address, then it, you know, the odds are that you're about to buy a house, right? Now it's not always the case, but that's what the odds are. And of course the, the numbers usually hold true. And so therefore you're a prime target for, uh, you know, for, you know, all those types of people that I actually uh, illustrated before, insurance, mortgage, everything. Okay. Remember the three primary goals of your digital sales funnel are usually sales, exposure, or attendance. Sales, that's easy to understand. We've all seen sites, you know, not necessarily just Amazon, but other other localized sites that actually sell stuff on e-commerce. Exposure is usually government, and attendance is usually either politicians or entertainment, right? Nightclubs, parties, concerts, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. movies, uh, art shows you know, wine tastings, that's all in events, right? So events of all kinds, they want attendance. And then of course, politicians are both exposure and attendance, uh, exposure in that they want you to know who they are and attendance because they want you to actually get out and vote on election day. So that's uh, the digital sales funnel is something we pay great attention to in the Eloco Day course for intro to digital marketing. Last but not least, <clears throat> focus on <coughs> Bad time to have a regular cough, I apologize. Focus on selling the change and the experience, right? I mean, Ray-Ban sunglasses technically are no better or no worse than any other sunglasses that you're gonna find in the market. But the reason why Ray-Bans have this cachet, let's say, within the sunglasses world is because of the movie Risky Business. Remember Risky Business? Well, for 20 years after that, anybody who actually wanted to feel cool like Tom Cruise would buy those Ray-Ban sunglasses. And so that's the whole aspect of selling an experience, selling a change. Um, and we go through examples, uh, you know, we go through a, quite a few examples. Um, another example that we go through is the Airbnb example, right? What are you doing when you buy Airbnb? It's Airbnb, it's because you're traveling, right? Which is why that newsletter that comes out from Airbnb talks about destinations and what you can do. It doesn't actually, highlight like in the in that content marketing email that airbnb sends out they don't highlight the actual listings what they do is they highlight the destinations like here's what you can do in boston here's what you can do in new york city here's what you can do in orlando blah 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 right and then airbnb is simply the vehicle that you can use to go on this destination kind of holiday right so they're not selling the listings they're selling the experience, the reason why you would travel. And, and then, of course, they're proposing that you use Airbnb to stay in while you're there. OK. All right. A couple of case studies for you before we get to Q&A time. OK. <laughs> the first one is a friend of mine. His website is Rame.ca. And what his product is, is a gelatinous shave bar. Now, I had the pleasure of meeting Nick because we were both Invest Ottawa um, incubator st startups a few years ago. And with Nick, he, he's a younger guy. He's only in his early 30s. I'm ancient, by the way, 1,000 years old. Um, the, uh, the thing with Nick is what he did, he was at Carleton in chemistry, and he did his thesis on this gelatinous shave bar that supposedly gave a closer shave for women by using a bar instead of shaving cream. So what Nick did is after he graduated, he started a business and his first year was, was with Rexall drugstores and that didn't go exactly as planned. Uh, anybody who's ever dealt with a major drug, uh, like a major chain like that knows that they use their muscle to take most of the money. Whereas, uh, so anyway, after 12 months, he cancels the deal with them and then started to sell his Ramey Shave Bar direct online to the customer through a website. Now, Nick is not a true blue organic digital marketer full blown like I am. Right. So what he does is he starts going to paid ads and uh, with his paid ads, his first number of campaigns were just horrible. Uh, fortunately, he didn't use a huge budget on those things, so he didn't lose a lot of money. Finally, though, after many, many trials, he arrives at his magic formula. Right. His first three criteria were age, gender and location. And of course, those are the big three for anybody. 
right? For the starting point for any campaign, really. But his fourth criteria, which actually is a really, really great example of the hyper-targeting that I talked about earlier, his fourth example was, or sorry, his fourth criteria was uh, people who had indicated on Facebook that they were in some sort of relationship. The logic being is that if a woman who's in a relationship actually shaves more, right? A little bit of a greater attention to personal hygiene. And I have no idea whether this is actually true or not, but what did happen is Nick's sales shot at the roof. Because what he was doing before is he was just doing age, gender, location. And therefore, you know, it was kind of hit or miss whether he was actually reaching people with his ad budget who actually wanted to buy, you know, a next level shave bar. But then when he started experimenting and getting into criteria that allowed him to hyper target properly to people who were more likely to actually buy a, a like a next level shave bar, then what ended up happening is his ad budget started going farther and his sales increased a result you know accordingly anyway he's doing great now he's got a new girlfriend he's he's shopping for rings or something like that because he's got all kinds of money now so good for him but it just got, goes to show you that within digital marketing anything is possible okay <laughs> so crowdfluence uh, dot app is actually my product and it's designed to uh to aggregate local influencers and we used it last year in uh, for a local prom dress store uh, by collecting the most popular girl at every store and or every school, let's say, sorry, and getting that girl to influence to her peers at her school on behalf of that prom dress store, and that actually resulted in a in a three x increase in revenue for that retail store over the prom dress season. And anybody knows anything about retail? you would uh, easily understand that she was very, very happy because of that. So, okay, so I'm gonna end the formal slides there. I'm gonna get to some questions here. Uh, Cindy Kennedy, are you referring to Link Juice? Uh, I assume that we were talking, uh, that was when we were talking about backlinks, and that's exactly right, right? The more backlinks you have and the more relevant backlinks you have, you are going to get a higher ranking on Google, okay? Now, don't just, Go for any old backlink on any crappy site that you can actually um, that you can actually find. In 2011, Google changed their algorithm quite significantly. Uh, 2011 and 2013 were the Panda and Penguin updates, and uh, and they actually what they did was they actually clamped down on backlink spam farms. So you have to make sure that your backlinks go on relevant sites. So don't just you know, choose any site anywhere that offers like backlinks. And the and most importantly, don't pay for backlinks anymore. And Google can actually detect that now. If you pay for backlinks, Google will give you a penalty, right? Now, here's an, an important thing to actually talk about, negative SEO, right? You say to yourself, okay, well, if putting my URL on a spammy backlink site is going to hurt me, what's to stop my competitor from doing negative SEO tricks and doing that to me. Well, there's something called the Google disavow tool, right? And which is why you have to have a really good tool in order to identify uh, backlinks that are causing you harm, okay? So why don't we go into Google Analytics here? I'm gonna show you what I mean by a, a possible spammy backlink. So this is the Google Analytics for the Wakefield Mill. Uh, they're a, 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 a really, really great boutique hotel up in Wakefield, which is outside of Ottawa. Um, let's take a look at acquisition, okay? Overview. Okay. Referral is what they talk about uh, as being traffic that comes from backlinks, okay? You can see this is low. I mean, obviously the metrics this week are terrible. Now, <coughs> therefore, look. Okay, so take a look now, Cindy, and everybody else. We can all we can see where these backlinks are actually coming from, right? So Rasizi is a reservation system. That's normal. Narcity, uh, Coupe de Pousse. I mean, I recognize all of these sites, okay, but I don't actually recognize editor.wix.com. 
that is not a backlink that I actually had a hand in creating or maintaining. Okay, so therefore, it's one of those things where I have to take a look at that site and I have to make sure that it's a decent site. Okay, now because it comes from Wix.com, I'm not too worried about it, but the point is, I didn't know that that existed, and so therefore, I'll pay attention to it. Okay, so I've seen in my time on you know looking at Google Analytics, I've seen some really, really malicious backlinks out there. And once you find a malicious backlink, what you have to do is you have to take that URL and you have to go to a tool that Google offers for free called the Google Disavow tool. And you have to enter that malicious, potentially malicious backlink in there. And what happens when you do that is Google is going to uh, not use that URL to calculate your link juice, let's say, okay? Uh, Eric Lupian, uh, can I ask a question about crawlers? Yes, you can. Go ahead and post it. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, hang on. Well, my, my question is, um, can you force the Google web crawler to go to your site perhaps uh, more often than every eight weeks? If, for example, you change pages on the site and create a new sitemap and upload that to the Google console? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for the quick answer. You can't tell Google to do anything, right? Right. It's just, it's just one of those things where uh, Google has its way of doing things, and you know they're a massive company that pretty much rules the search world, and they do things their way, and there's nothing you can do about it. What you can do is argue about certain results, right? And the more and more that you find out about SEO, the more and more you're going to be able to see that you may be taking penalties that you shouldn't be taking, okay? And uh, and if that's the case and you start to discover those kinds of, of deficiencies, let's say, there are mechanisms where you can, you know, like uh, ask for a, a review, let's say, right? But the Google bot stuff, right, that's, um, unfortunately, that's an automated system. One, now, once you're in the system, you never have to ask Google again. Like back in the day with Yahoo, every time you wanted to be crawled, you had to fill out a form, right? Because Yahoo mm -hmm. was never really a search engine. Yahoo was actually just a glorified directory. But Google is an actual search engine, and all this stuff happens automatically. So no, unfortunately. Uh, all right, thank you. Yeah, Dean Campbell, uh, client. Okay, so Dean Campbell, that wasn't a question. That was he actually just left, okay? All right, there is, um, okay, so it's 12.03. I'm going to show you a couple of things that I actually think are really important, okay? Now, anybody who's ever done any digital marketing knows that we all have to pay for tools, right? And usually those tools are on a subscription basis, all right? Now, they might not seem like a lot of things, uh, like a lot, like a, a heavy price, let's say. I mean, 10 bucks a month here, 20 bucks a month there. You might say to yourself, oh, that's not that much. It's a good tool. I'll subscribe to it. But you're going to get, if you're like a, running a proper business, let's say, you may get to the point where you're paying two to 300 bucks a month in tools, and that becomes a problem, all right? So what I do, and what I think you all should do as well, is first of all, subscribe to AppSumo.com, all right? Now, why am I telling you this? AppSumo is kind of like the Groupon for digital tools, all right? That's how you should think of these people. And what they do, and they're not as bad as Groupon, of course, but what they do is they actually um, do deals with these digital tool type companies and they, uh, they offer deals that are a one-time lifetime license payment, all right? So for example, if you go into browse, their deal right here, Social Animal, it, it's Content Marketing Insights, right? It's only 69 bucks forever. So it's one payment of $69 and you have a lifetime license. Right, and I can't tell you how many tools I have acquired uh, through AppSumo in this kind of format, and it saves me a bundle of money. I mean, I think it probably saves me about five, six hundred bucks a month um, in in monthly fees that I don't have to pay because of the fact that I actually bought that one-time license. All right. Um, anyway, you can just if you go to AppSumo and you go to browse, you can see all the types of deals that they have out there currently. And if you subscribe to their email, you'll get their new deal. And they have usually they have one new deal every week. Sometimes they actually have two. Uh, and you know it doesn't matter. You don't have to buy them all. But occasionally, what's going to happen is there's going to be a tool that comes around that you are going to like. Um, so you know, for example, 
I bought this tool about six months ago. for online training and I hadn't used it. I never used it from the day I bought it, but nowadays everybody and their brother is actually hopping online for online training. So we're starting to deliver, you know, all kinds of different training with CoAssemble. Just a, an example of a tool that you can actually uh, put together for yourself, okay? Um, another tool that is worth actually showing you guys is Well, this SERP stat I think I showed you already, right? Um, That's a yeah. Here's Moz. Now, Moz is the biggest tool like SERP stat out there. It's the biggest SEO um, monitoring tool, okay? Uh, this is a tool that they have within Moz. It's called Link Explorer, and it's actually free. You will have to sign up for an account, but this Link Explorer is free. And you can actually see all the different backlinks that are out there uh, that, uh, that, you know, that are linking back to your site. It's not something you have to actually pay for. Moz gives this for free, okay? Um, and that's at moz.com slash link dash explorer. Then there's SEM Rush, and they have a number of free tools as well. You can do a domain overview, which is the same thing as as what SEO Site Checker does. And then this guy here, Neil Patel, he's actually quite famous in the digital marketing industry. And he has a number of tools that he actually gives out for free. Hold on. So you can see his tools here SEO Analyzer, A B Testing Calculator, Uber Suggest for Keywords backlinks and subscribers and they're all free tools that you can actually use so actually let's do uh loving .ca and use neil patel's tool so it's going to take a few minutes that's how long these things usually take we'll just uh let that thing go in the meantime, while we're waiting for loving pause analysis to go through, are there any other questions and you know that I can give answers to today? Does anybody have anything? If you have a question, just put it right into the chat window. All right, no questions. All right, I, it looks like some results are starting to come back. So you can see here that it's giving a whole tremendous amount of information, organic monthly traffic, organic keywords, number of backlinks, health check, right? These broken and have issues, you have to pay attention to these things because they're causing you problems if they're there. But loving pause seems to be okay for now. Eight critical errors, uh -oh. right? You got to fix those right away. Site speed. So this this lovingpause.ca site has some really bad site speed right now. You have to fix that. And uh, anyway, listen, any this is a free tool. You just go to neilpatel.com and, uh, and then go to the tools menu, and you can see them all there, and you're welcome to use them anytime you want. They don't cost you any money. Um, uh, Andrea D., yes, this meeting is being recorded. Uh, you'll have to ask Jody when you will receive a copy. I know that my instructions are that I'm to make sure that uh, that the recording gets processed and delivered to him. After that, it's in his hands, Jody at, at the Eloqua office. Um, by the way, we're all working from home, from home right now, just like the rest of you. So uh, uh, we're all in this together kind of thing. Um, all right. If there's no other questions, I guess we'll – oh, Eric Lupien, question, yes? Eric, do you have your question? Sorry, uh, how do you know? How do you know if it's the content or the server? Because I have to tell you, on that loving pause that site, I've been I worked on it quite extensively. It's a uh, it's a WordPress site. It's I thought it was on a reliable server, GoDaddy, but I'm starting oh, to no, think no. it might be the server. Okay, so I'm I'm going to suggest to you that it's probably both. All right, okay. first of all, get off GoDaddy immediately. Okay, <laughs> just. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, what I use for mine is I use uh, I use Amazon AWS, but you sort of have to be a uh, uh, like an IT pro to use Amazon. So with, sure. in your case, what I'm going to suggest is you use a site. There's a couple of different hosts that you know that a regular person can use. Number one is called WP Engine, and number sure. two, number two is called um, is called excuse me Flywheel. And both of those are WordPress optimized. Now, the thing you have to know about WordPress is that the entire WordPress framework adds time into the load speed. There are things that you can do to optimize your WordPress load speed, but you kind of have to, you know, you have to be a, a coder, like not an expert, but you have to know what you're doing in order to actually optimize. Like, look, you got 60 critical errors here, right? You got to, like that's stuff that's not server related. That's stuff that's content related. Okay. Um, I mean, you know, obviously in only a few minutes, there's, I mean, I, I'd have to actually get access to your source code to actually do a complete analysis. But I think, uh, I think that, um, well, I mean, just looking from this report here, you got a lot of work to do, my friend. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, but, uh, but do, like do, do explore it because I mean, I, I do know that that whole pet care industry, are you, Eric, are you here in Ottawa? Yep. Okay, yep. so I know that there's a number of uh, of different pet care type of uh, businesses out there, and uh, and they're all wanting that same SEO placement page one that you are. And like these sixty critical errors here that the Neil Patel tool is telling you, I mean, you got to take a look at those. You got to run this on your end and take a look. And I mean, if you do your listen, put it this way: if you do your website yourself, this is a great opportunity for you to learn. Right. Yeah. But first, yeah. first and foremost, get your WordPress website off of GoDaddy and move it on to uh, Flywheel or WP Engine and, uh, okay. and away you go. And, and if you're if you're looking for an easy way to back up your WordPress site and migrate it over, the plug in that I use is uh, is always called uh, Backup Buddy. Backup Buddy. OK, Backup back Buddy. Get that plug in, install it and it'll uh, it'll help your migration process really, really easily. OK. Thank you. No worries. All right. Unless there's any other questions, I think we'll call it a, a morning and uh, get back to uh, our lives. And uh, hopefully you've learned a little something today and, and perhaps you'll uh, be more interested in taking the day long Eloqua course. Um, usually they're they're in class, but we have an online uh, component as well. And I have a feeling that that online component is going to be uh, increased as the weeks and months go on. Uh, but ultimately, I, either way, I hope to see you, whether it's online or in class, and uh, let's learn some more digital marketing stuff together. Thanks for Thank coming, you. and we'll see you again. Thank you very much.